Hey, welcome everybody. I am very pleased to introduce to you Tony Curtis, who is a professor of mass communication at UNC Pembroke. Uh, Tony founded and edits Space Today Online, which is pretty cool. Take a look at that when you get a chance. He teaches and builds extensively in Second Life, and he's an Apple Distinguished Educator uh, among a list of um, many, many achievements and honors. And Tony is going to tell us today about digital storytelling, an ancient tradition in the 21st century. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Rachel. And I, I hope I wasn't simply overdriving the mic because I might get excited <laughs> and do that again. Um, somebody tell me yes in local chat if you're hearing me clearly now. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and tell me if it gets fuzzy because who knows what happens. I want to say that we've, very, uh, we've been very well introduced to the topic of digital storytelling in our um, keynote remarks this morning, and so I don't want to belabor the point that my idea about an ancient tradition is, of course, this is based on the ancient art of storytelling, but what I want to talk about is the contemporary 21st century version of that, which I refer to as mediated communication, and this will combine the um, traditional techniques that you might find in uh, television, uh, video production, radio, newspapers, magazines, um, and we'll combine those in a way that uh, presents something that's um, very contemporary. The um, digital stories that, uh, that I want to describe to you today, and I want to be very practical in how I go about this, are um, uh, all very scripted, very much scripted. Everything begins with a script that focuses the writing before any stills, any video, any audio are created or manipulated. Um, the first thing you have is a script. And I know in the earlier session somebody asked, which do you have first, the idea or the materials? Here you start with the ideas, prepare a script, and, and then um, make the materials. These stories are all very personal, as you'll see from the examples that I'm going to show you. Um, it's all about the voice of the narrator, which is an articulation of a coherent verbal expression. The voice of the narr narrator is everything in these. And that uh, is the narrator making it clear how something or somebody has impacted on his or her life. These are concise productions ranging generally from two to five minutes. When I do this in the classroom, um, I tell the students that, and of course there are some who are have more than others find it difficult to edit, so sometimes they'll run six or seven minutes, but uh, generally I say two, two, to, uh, two to five minutes for these. These are done with simple, readily available materials, stuff that's easy to locate, still photos, hand drawings, scanned images, transition effects, recorded narratives. And the story elements are all universal, universal story elements um, that um, um, have conflict, have transformation, have closure in, way, in a way in which the audience can identify and uh, itself be changed by having viewed the uh, digital story. These are often innovative collaborations. In my classroom, I let students work together on these. Uh, because they're very personal, some want to work alone, and some want to work with other people. Uh, notice that I say they could be poems and songs. I would like to uh, start today with um, one that is that a student in my class has prepared. Um, it is a song, and uh, oh, I should have said before, these are college sophomores. These are not uh, professionally produced materials as we, as the example we saw earlier today. These are all done by people who are learning to be professionals, therefore are still amateur, and they're generally speaking sophomores in my classes. So let's take a look at this uh, first one. Look, 
yo I'm seeing things differently, attitude shifting One time was a gift, but I've been in some dust Fall so par it seems On the grind for the cream, the American dream Cops, blue badge in the red for my beam As a marksman starts his target practice Militant, the victim stood into the bullet A backflip, his masses Splatter all over the concrete This ain't no foreign matter that's beyond the back streets Of the ghetto that you will usually pertain this tale Already fed it with the feds and my people's to jail And I know we all wrong, but look where we are from A place where we're given this sh** in this position Genocide kill every essence of our pride Before a baby sees like he already died Offspring from mothers were cracked up in their veins So he can't see reality, he's immune to pain Sunshine in the summer, he relates to the cold rains And it's cold, it's chilling, and you know it's real when Katrina victims must have been his refugees Stealing cause they lack help from federal rescue fleets But that's a minor image that's upon this puzzle piece A reminiscent of the silent mother of the deceased Who tried multiple times to have success for offspring Dear Lord, how many times will I present an offering of my life for 10 plus years? I sacrificed, cried too many times as my babies died. You see, she lived in the ghetto, couldn't adjust to the temple. His bullets flew through the window, now the babies do. Straight one hit the sea, said to watch a young and bleed. Life is freaking from that bullet wound. Too soon, his tomb from the wound he went. You never know of his destiny. Hell, he could have been the first black president. Well, that's just how it is in his residence. You know what help us so depressing? As we go through these, I'm sure you'll begin to get the idea about what I mean, how personal they are, the personal narrative effect. Um, the next one I want to do is, is of a totally different nature, but let me just say how this happens in my class, because I want to be as practical as possible and explain to you in case any of you would like to adapt these for your own teaching environments. What I do is I do this in the first half of a semester, and these part this particular set that I'm showing you today are from a course that is about broadcast script writing. Uh, broadcast copywriting, uh, broadcast production, kind of a specialized course in which I do this in the first half of the semester. This is really a mid-semester assignment, and as I say, it's a sophomore level course. I, I explain to them what I'm explaining to you and tell them that it can be all of these types, or any of these types, I mean, that you see here on the uh, projected in this slide. And um, so the next one I want to show you is um, um, a personal narrative that is um, uh, quite different. It's called Moment of Clarity. Happiness, confusion, Happiness, confusion pain, pain, realizing and finding, realizing yourself. And finding yourself. This is my story. This is my story. My moment of clarity. My moment of clarity. I was a typical high school student. I went out and participated in activities and of course I had my select group of friends. We all understood each other, shared laughs, and sometimes tears. You can also say I was a very family-oriented girl. The always came first no matter what. My mom and my sister were my best friends. We kept each other smiling through the good and the bad. To people on the outside looking in, it seemed like everything was great and I couldn't be better. But little did they know what I was really feeling. Behind my smile was tons of pain and confusion. I was holding a secret, a feeling from my family and friends. I wanted to, I needed to let them know I was feeling, 
and how I was changing. I needed to let them know I was gay. I made the decision to keep my sexuality to myself and out of conversations as much as possible while I was in high school. I continued my life in college as I did in high school, all smiles, some tears, with tons of laughter. Around my sophomore year, I began to realize I was unhappy and needed to let everything out about my sexuality and my life. When I made the decision to confide in my roommate about my feelings for females, to my surprise, she took it well and she said she was there for me no matter what. After I talked to my roommate, I began to let others know about my secret. Of course, I got mixed reactions. First came the stares and the whispers. Next came the name calling. You know, typical dyke, faggot, and lesbo. But I didn't let that get to me. I still had my friends, old and new, that kept me going. I finally felt complete. I came out by my sexuality and realized I no longer needed to hide anything anymore. I also realized that I was still me, still loving, caring, family-oriented me. Despite some negativity, loss of friends, and some family members, I found myself accepted and embraced it and ended up with a great girl. I wouldn't trade any of this experience for the world. Happiness, Happiness love, love, realizing, realizing my, true my true self. This is my, this story. Is my story. My, moment of, my clarity. moment of clarity. My moment of clarity. Um, may I say that one thing I do to induce the students to be willing to take part in this, since they're sophomores and aren't experienced at production, is I tell them that we're not talking about pro uh, professional production values. We're really talking about getting their voice out, ha letting them say what they want to say, talk about a topic that they want to talk about, and uh, and and go from there. And this, uh, if you if you sell this concept to them, they will, um, generally speaking, buy into the idea that. Um, uh, they they are allowed to speak what they want to speak about. I tell them there's no restriction on on what they can talk about. Here's another one. This is called Why We Believe. I've been a fan of the Buffalo Bills for 22 years. In that time, I've seen my team lose four Super Bowls, endured playoff losses so heartbreaking they have their own name, like the Music City Miracle. And as of late, they've seen about as much action in the playoffs as Archie Manning. So why, amidst all of this heartache, loss, and pain, do I continue to believe? Why does anyone continue to believe, to follow their team with fierce loyalty and passion, when any sane person would just shut off the TV and go on about their day? As fans, we continue to believe because our team continues to be a light in the darkness when all other lights have gone out because our team can cause us to jump out of our seats in victory and crumple to our knees in defeat. Because our team has the ability to satisfy our basic human needs. Our team protects us, keeps us warm, brings us together, inspires us, and allows us to believe in magic and even miracles. We continue to believe because it doesn't matter what our team has done in the past. There is always the next play, the next game, and always next year. Because the game itself is constant. Our team doesn't break up with us, find new friends, or die. When the leaves begin to fall, our team is always there come Sunday with a new opponent a new plan of attack, and a new hope that they will once again deliver us from evil. We continue to believe because the entire game hinges on where we sit and how we wear our hat. Rituals occurring in bars and living rooms all over the world that in no small way are the difference between victory and certain death. We continue to believe because a jersey isn't just a shirt, but a code of honor that shows who we stand with and what we stand for. We continue to believe because on the field, things are simple. On that patch of grass, it's not about politics, a job, going to the gym, or anything else that makes our daily lives so mundane. Defend your territory and invade your opponents. It's that simple. We continue to believe because a loss on Sunday 
means Monday and Tuesday are wasted. And a win means Monday doesn't matter. We continue to believe because it's about more than standings, stats, or trophies. Because believe it or not, it's as much about losing as winning. When you win, it's easy to be a fan. Anyone can celebrate. When you just got whipped 42 to 10, or even worse, 20 to 17, can you still wear your jersey with pride and cheer even the smallest successes? Because when it comes right down to it, what really binds us to our team is the experiences we've shared as we've lived and died together. We continue to believe because loyalty to our team isn't fleeting. It doesn't lie in a player, coach, or owner. Players retire, coaches move on, and owners die. But a true fan's loyalty to their team is as steadfast and immortal as the logo itself. We continue to believe because one day, the stars will align, hell will eventually freeze over, and our hope will be rewarded when our team puts it all together and brings home a championship. And a true fan knows at that moment, it has all been worth it. The ups and downs, the heartbreaks and triumphs, the victories and defeats. Not the fact that we struggled, but that we struggled together. Because we stood by our team and believed when nobody else would. When that moment finally sinks in, when the parties are swept up and the hype dies down, a true fan knows that only one thing matters. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The world champion Buffalo Bills. The game, huh? Yeah. Can do it again next year? Honestly, I like our chance. I mean, we, we just won the Super Bowl, so we don't have that much. Because there's always next year, and we always believe. And uh, let me, uh, while we're in that uh, mode, this the one I want to show you now, which is called uh, uh, Looking Back at the Stage Door Theater, is similar in some ways, but yet quite different from a, from a t point of view of a, t of a different student.
Well, I'm sorry if it stalled on <clears throat> on some of you. It stalled on me a couple of times, and I, I hope you saw the end of it. It's hard to tell what everybody's seeing, of course, at the same moment. Um, you saw on my slide there about that um, things like animations and machinimas are acceptable in this. Um, and uh, I've had about well, over 200 students in Second Life in the last three years. I teach in Second Life as well as Blackboard and, of course, face-to-face. And um, so every once in a while, somebody wants to uh, be brave enough to make a machinima. So what I'd like to show you is a machinima about a uh, typical spring break, if you'll look for this now. today can be very creative and you'll notice on my list that I permit fiction as well as nonfiction um, fictional stories are fine and 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 this one uh, that I want to show you now is uh, it's called murder and revenge peace I hate the word as I hate hell, all Montagues. I had a dream last night. Cause it looked just like a dream. I had a dream last night. But it looked unlike a Mercy, mercy, I'm made out of cloth. Make me a suit so I can get it off. Heaven help me, my head's been round. Stop this airplane, cause I got to get down. I had a dream last night.
I want you to take away from this presentation today that these are very personal narratives, and it's really all about the voice of the narrator. And I want to take your questions. I have one last very short one I'd like to show you. This is the, uh, um, the Andre Beth story. Your best story. Who would have known, 20-some years ago, two destinies would meet and become one? It all began about four years ago. He was filling out an application to attend UNC Pembroke in the fall, and she was deciding against going to college. However, she still applied for admission to one, UNC Pembroke. Come the last part of their senior year, in high school, they both received acceptance letters. And that is how the Andre Best story begins. Meet Andre Caleb Hale, a loving, funny, outgoing, and possibly the greatest guy you will ever meet. Meet Bethany Ann Bean, a dedicated, caring, driven young woman. Freshman year, he liked her roommate. She liked his sense of humor but they kept their distance. Sophomore year. He liked her second roommate. She thought he was funny. They began to hang out at times during first semester. By the end of the academic year, they hung out all the time and they began a lifelong friendship. Junior year. They fell in love with the friendship they shared. She realized she needed him, his advice, his smile, his heart, he realized. If you go around kissing dumpsters, you're bound to have naked bitches follow you. And that's friendship in a can. Aristotle. What? If you kiss dumpsters, okay, listen, you're bound to have naked bitches follow you. And that's friendship in a can. We don't listen. And they share a friendship only they understand. I don't understand it. Okay, that's, I think, about all the time we have today. I want to leave uh, time for your questions. We have about, whatever it is, uh, 12 minutes more. So please feel free to ask me questions. Thank you, Tony. Those were great. I, I'm just amazed at the range of talent and imagination that your students have, uh, and they were making those movies. I, I have a quick question while we're waiting. Yeah, actually, Ellen's got my question in chat, which is, how long does it take them to make? How long do they work on these movies? Well, as I said, this was a uh, first half of the semester, which would be about seven or eight weeks, uh, and I. Uh, overlay this assignment over other work that we're doing in the course. So it, they did the whole thing in, let's say, seven weeks, um, each one of them individu working individually. And uh, they had to round up their own materials, any people that were going to participate. They had to act as their own producer. Um, and everything you saw there, they did in that period of time. That's amazing. That's I just, wow. I'm floored. I, I made a tiny movie the other day and it was just uh, I can't imagine making something as involved as, as what your kids have made here. Uh, a couple well, questions. Oh, go ahead. L let me just say that um, s they're assisted in this way and that is that uh, we're a state university. We have uh, in our Department of Mass Communication we have tracks that include journalism, public relations, broadcasting and so forth. We do teach a lot of new media techniques and um, uh, this means that they have at their uh, they have access to uh, video cameras and um, editing labs and things, which helps. But then these are sophomores who haven't had very many courses. Some of them have never had any course in how to do that. Some of them use their own uh, uh, their own equipment. They, they even now that you can do video in an iPhone uh, today, they even do that. So. Uh, uh, it's it's there, there are some technical resources available to them, but uh, they had to figure it out on their own and help each other and do all this stuff, and that's how it comes about. That's great. I'm going to relay some of the questions from the chat here. Um, 
Cheryl would like to know who is the audience for your student stories? The audience is whoever they want the audience to be because I, I to me it's about doing digital storytelling as as an um, end result in itself and so I, part of what they figure out is who they want to tell this story to. Obviously in the short run the audience is the class itself and this is usually a class of 15 to 20 students um, and so those 15 to 20 people are showing their works to each other during class sessions uh, and and uh, all of these are on YouTube. The students all like to put their things on YouTube, so they're all available on YouTube also. But uh, the audience beyond that is whoever they think that they want to see it. They're Generally speaking, I think it's safe to say they're so proud of their work that they include their family and friends and their extended uh, network of people that as a part of the audience. Buffy wants to know, do you talk about copyright to the students? Oh, absolutely. And the permissions for the some of the uh, audio, some of the uh, soundtrack you heard there and things. Oh, yes, we make them do all of that. Uh, everything has to be totally legal and above board. And the university, um, for our various uh, broadcast and other media operations, buys licenses for a lot of things, and those licenses are extended to the students. Uh, we have, Yes, of course, we have to take care of all that. And uh, Alan asks, do they develop the concept first before going to media? Yes. That's why I stress that everything is scripted. They come up with an idea, they, they write a script, and uh, all of this is at stages of approval in class, uh, various ways. Some by peer approval, in which we thoroughly discuss each idea. Each student comes to class and thoroughly discusses the idea, but also approval by me in the sense that um, I want to make sure it adheres to the sort of broad assignment that I've given them. So, so they come up with the idea, and then they write the script, and then they go out and produce it. And related to that, um, Kenneth is asking about the framework or the scaffolding that you provide to the students. Do you talk to them about um, uh, digital stories? And, and Mark asks, uh, do you tie in their digital stories to ancient oral traditions? And do you explain the, the framework of digital storytelling? Or is it sort of a free-for-all, here are the tools, tell a story? Oh, it's not a free-for-all. I mean, it's not, not <laughs> it probably seems that way, the way I'm talking about it. But um, um, I have the whole thing planned out ahead of time, well ahead of time in my mind. Um, and so as a teacher, I bring that framework to the classroom. Um, another invisible bit of assistance to the students is that uh, another one of my courses is the uh, um, the uh, history of journalism. I teach that course, and the way I have approached that course for the last decade is to go all the way back to the beginning of time, really. And so they we start uh, uh, even before printing, and. Uh, to include comments on this. And since I've been teaching digital storytelling, I make sure that that other course uh, talks about oral tradition and stuff in the, in the earliest parts of the course. And um, uh, I do this uh, as, a, as yet another pedagogical technique, and that is to get them to integrate information they learn in various classes um, across the barricades between the classes. So they bring that stuff. Uh, virtually all the students will have had that course at an earlier time. And uh, they bring that in kind of information in also. Of course, at an earlier time. And uh, they bring that in kind of information in also. Ed, did you have a question? Ed, your mic is open. Okay. Um, if you had a question, Ed, go ahead and you can ask it. All right, meanwhile, um, Joan has a, a related question to what you were just talking about, Tony, with, um, with the journalism skills, which is, do you teach principles that enhance the use of new media to convey the stories, for example, the grammar of film editing um, and, and other types of media? I teach, I teach new media from a practical point of view. So that means, in, in the short run, what that means is that I introduce them to and encourage them to use and show them how to use blogs, wikis, uh, Twitter, you know, on and on like that. Um, in terms of theoretical, no. This course doesn't have any theoretical, as, as Joan is asking about. 
Okay. And Tony Sams is curious about uh, what kinds of software issues you have to overcome. Well, um, in our department, most of the students are using Macintosh, Final Cut Pro, and other you know related software. Um, what I find today is that the students. And by the way, this is a uh, this is not. Um, how can I put this delicately? This is a university of what you might call ordinary college students. These are not um, the, the 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 most uh, the highest the highest scores on their SATs and things like that. Uh, these are let's just leave it at ordinary college students. And, but yet, what I find is that if you motivate them correctly, they'll go out and find what they need, learn to use it, make it happen. They're very resourceful young people today and they they can do that and they do do it and naturally I give them every bit of help I can because I've used most of the software and hardware and know how to do it so when they have a specific question I make myself available to answer that either in class or outside but the students the students are very capable I think uh, the results of their work make that very clear um, Alan asks do uh, former students ever continue to create or use stories after they leave your class? Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, some of you may have taught a course in Second Life, and you may know that uh, if you bring 20 students in a class into Second Life, if you have five that enjoy it enough that they hang around later to do their own thing in Second Life, you're lucky. It's the same way with this kind of production. Um, students today are willing to adapt to what's required by a course, and they love to learn the new things in there, but it doesn't mean that they're going to go out and then continue to do digital storytelling of this type. Um, if they were called upon in their careers to do that, then they would be prepared to do it and could, but it, uh, again, it'll be a, a minority of the students who will continue to do this um, just on their own time. Uh, like everyone in life, students are very busy and they have a lot of demands on their time, and so um, when you direct them to do something for a course, they'll willingly give that time and do a good job on it, but that doesn't mean that they really would pick it up and do it uh, in their free time. They may do other things. Sure, which is kind of what education and learning is all about, right? Trying a lot of different things. Um, Alan also asks, how do you help students who struggle with um, choosing a story or with ideas that they want to talk about? I sit down and talk to them, and I'll say, you, you've heard what other people have said in class, and I'll, I'll sit down in private with them and talk to them, I mean, and uh, I'll ask them what they've heard, what ideas have occurred to them, and often an idea or two that they've rejected for some reason, and so I'll try to build on that and say, well, that wasn't a bad idea at all, and here's some positives about it and some negatives, and let's talk about that a little more, and generally out of that will come an idea, maybe not even their exact original idea, but it'll develop into something they can get fired up about and go and work on. And a uh, final question that's inspired by a comment from Joan Getman. Um, she remarks, if their stories are on YouTube, getting comments from the viewing audience must be motivating, and I'm wondering what, what if any, has the reaction of your students been to the comments that they get on YouTube? They love that. They love that. They, they go and look for it. Shortly after they post on YouTube, they start looking, and they do it for a while, at least till the end of the semester, if they're still thinking about it at that point. Um, in all the time I've been doing this, I've had one student go back and withdraw his, um, his digital story. Uh, this was a student who was physically challenged and talked. It was a wonderful piece. He talked about that what he's, the handicaps that he's overcome in life. But um, my impression now is that it may have, he may have felt embarrassed or something else and he removed it but the only one out of all the many that I've done have chosen to to take it down and I don't think it was from what the comment what any commenter said but rather he was just self-conscious I think about what he had said I think it's wonderful that um, not only can your students create these stories to share with their classmates and their families but that there's a place where they can have you know a, a global audience I think that's just amazing um, well, we're, let, we're, me thank, oh, let, yeah. let me th let me thank Alan for what he said about uh, noticing the thousands of views. These things do get lots of views because uh, I, people are taken with what they have to what these um, personal narratives have to say.